Okay, I think it's a, a good time and uh, I can start by introduce our uh, guest speaker here. And uh, thank you everyone to join our webinar hosted by the PolyU, the Tripoli Department and uh, SFP Hong Kong Student Chapter. So today we have a great pleasure to uh, invite uh, uh, my great friend, uh, Professor Kai Yuan Li from Wuhan University of Technology. And Professor Li has a, a lot of experience in fire research, from experimental research to numerical simulation. And he got his PhD uh, from University of Science and Technology of China. And uh, he has been a developer for fire dynamics simulator. And um, I think uh, Professor Li has been a lecturer uh, at uh, University of Canterbury uh, at, in the New Zealand, as well as a uh, researcher in uh, Otto University in Finland, as well as uh, in French uh, Science Academy. So he has a lot of experience overseas uh, and uh, uh, his research area covers uh, from the pyrosis and combustion, flame spread, timber, fire, and uh, material decomposition, uh, many things. And uh, I have to say, Professor Lee is uh, probably uh, one of the best uh, fire motor in the world. So I hope you guys will enjoy his uh, presentation today. It's about uh, uh, modeling the larger scale fire uh, in the compartment made by the wood material. And now I will let uh, uh, hand a stage to Professor Lee. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Xin Yan, for the uh, introduction. Uh, and also, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to the lecture. And I hope, uh, uh, I hope you guys can see my uh, screen and I hope uh, the presentation would be a little bit uh, uh, either interesting or, uh, or uh, helpful uh, to all the audience. And uh, I would say thank you very much for coming. All right, hello everybody. So uh, this is my topic. Um, today I'm going to give a presentation uh, in regards to the uh, modeling the large scale flame spread in FDS. So uh, I will be covering the follow contents, including the research background, pyrosis model in FDS, small scale and large scale flame spread modeling. So I, I have uh, probably too many slides, so I have to make it a little bit quick. So if you guys have any question, we'll be discussing it afterwards. All right, so the first thing is go, uh, a little bit, uh, a brief introduction for the research background. Uh, FDS uh, is a famous software in fire engineering world. So basically, uh, I think um, it's, it's uh, quite popular uh, tool in performance-based design, at least in China, I would say probably 100% of the performance-based design uh, in a project in China has been using FDS. I mean, uh, uh, at least for me, I haven't ever seen any other uh, software has been used apart from uh, recently I'm using CFAST for a pretty special project. Um, the thing is, when we're doing performance-based design using FDS, we don't really put in a real combustion process. We don't, we don't really modeling a real material combustion in FDS. We just use a sort of like a fake fire source instead of a real dealing with a real uh, flame spread process like a real fire. So the purpose of me doing all this uh, research is to model a real combustion process in this project, maybe in the future, but no, no, at the moment, that's kind of like the long-term target of the, the research. Uh, we all know basically a uh, uh, large scale flame spread is a very popular phenomenon. Um, um, almost every fire is uh, developing from a uh, flame spread uh, behavior is always start from an ignition source and then the flame spread to all, all the um, 
combustible materials. So that's what always uh, fire developer. And for large scale, uh, the flame spread uh, case is uh, even more obvious, but uh, FDS is very difficult to model such uh, phenomenon uh, for very various reason. There's some very interesting case. This is a fire happen, uh, take place in 2019 in New Zealand. So basically uh, what happened is that, that that's the, the building is named as a uh, city tower and it, its uh, facade is made of uh, ACP. So basically we talked to the, um, the holder, the building holder, and we, we taught him that ACP is very dangerous, but he kind of like a check on the Google and telling us it has excellent uh, fire resistance. But uh, interesting is uh, we talked to, to him like on uh, uh, kind of like April or something, but the, the fire took place on October, which taught him uh, basically the ACP is now really safe. Um, another uh, interesting thing regarding the material is uh, we all know the Greyfold Tower fire, right? So after that tower fire, uh, after that fire, everybody concerning about uh, the facade, facade fire, uh, we have a lot of research on the PIR material that has been used in the Greyfold. Uh, when we're dealing with that material, it, all, it also says it has very good uh, uh, fire resistance. Since it's a closed cell insulation material, but when we're doing the experiment in under core, we can see that it's really hard to ignite, but you, if you keep, keep hitting it up, after a while, it's going to explode. So a lot of this kind of like ignition, um, this kind of like flame particle will be generated and these things will kind of like benefit the flame spread in real uh, fire case. So that's the thing I would like to say for flame spread. In fact, every fire is a flame spread phenomenon. If you're looking at these general fires, we know in, uh, in our life, it, it kind of like this is very common. If you're looking at these pictures, this kind of like common flame spread problem if, uh, for the uh, Christmas tree fire, right? So for facade fire, it's also flame spread problem. And for this li liquid uh, flame spread uh, behavior, it's, it's quite easy to recognize. But for this kind of like general fire, such as the poor fire as this uh, picture at the right hand side, it, I mean, from a, a fire modeler point of view is also a flame spread problem. If you're looking at this poor fire, you can see basically uh, the liquid surface is descending, right? Uh, during the combustion. So this is, we can actually generalize this like uh, the condensed phase is pyrolyzing. So it's kind of like moving from the burned room to the unburned room. So the, uh, in a way, the flame is also spreading. So for all this combustion pro uh, combustion problem in FDS, we have uh, not sure. we have a framework for combustion modeling. So basically we have two solver in FDS. Uh, the one is the gas solver dealing with the gas gaseous frame and the other one is the solid solver dealing with the uh, condensed phase including the solid and the liquid. All right. So for this, uh, for this very common or very famous flame spread problem, which I we call is upward flame spread, we also having this two solver dealing with this problem, uh, including the solid solver and the gas solver. Another thing we got to be aware of is in between these two solvers, we have a phase interface. So basically, uh, as I show on the slide, the phase interface is kind of like the interface in between the solid and the gas uh, and the gas flame. So we have uh, the gas flame will create a boundary layer attached to your solid surface. This boundary layer is very small. So if you want to resolve, that's what we say the difficulty of dealing with frame spread problem. It's because if you want to resolve the boundary layer 
and the material surface, you need a very fine uh, grid resolution. So we are not talking about this kind of like the grid size and uh, of a uh, centimeter or, uh, or, or meter. We are not talking about the grid size like that. We are talking about the grid size like micrometer to millimeter. So if you want to kind of reproduce a flame spread process, you need to you need a such a high resolution grid size to actually uh, model the boundary boundary layer and the uh, face interface. So that's one of the difficulty because if you want uh, if you need such a grid size, you if you don't have that kind of grid size, you cannot uh, reproduce the flame spread problem. The, the flame wouldn't spread. I, I will talk about this later on. So before we dealing with the flame spread problem, we uh, need to understand the pyrolysis model in FDS. So for the solid solver, we basically have two major process. The first one is the chemical process dealing with the thermal decomposition of your material. And the second one is the physical process dealing with the heat transfer. So let's first talk about the chemical process, which is the pyrolysis model in FDS. Let's use the dry wood with three major components, hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin uh, as an example. So to understand the pyrolysis of wood, we need to understand the kinetics of wood pyrolysis. To understand the kinetics of wood pyrolysis, we need to use uh, the, the experimental tool, uh, which we call as uh, thermogrammetric analysis or TG or TGA. So we perform those TG or TGA experiment to wood, and we come up with this uh, TG curve. So based on the TG curve, we can kind of reproduce the pyrolysis reaction, what we call a parent reaction for material pyrolysis. So the first thing we need to do is we need to uh, kind of uh, having a reaction skin for the material pyrolysis. So what we always do for wood is we use this kind of like one step pyrolysis scheme so in this uh, in this reaction skin, A and D denote either hemicellulose, cellulose, or lignin. All right. So B and B and C is uh, the char and the gaseous product of the material, the same as E and F. So that's the quite common reaction skin we use for wood. But there are also some uh, uncommon reaction skin. If you look, we look here in the slides, for this two-step reaction skin, A means the wood, and B and D means, B means the tar, and D means some uh, intermediate uh, products. And if you eventually produ produce E and F, E and F uh, is the char and the gaseous product, all right? So we build up this uh, reaction skin, and then we can use a Arrhenius equation to reproduce uh, the pyrolysis process of the components. So we use a Arrhenius equ equation, we can reproduce the pyrolysis of hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin. And by combining this, the pyrolysis of the three components, we can reproduce the TG curve of wood. So we can predict the pyrolysis process of wood. So you just got to be aware that there are three major parameter in a Arrhenius equation, which is the A, pre-exponential pre factor, E, activation energy, and N, reaction order in the equation. So we just need to know these three parameters. We can basically um, predict the pyrolysis of whatever material you like. So this is the chemical part. So for the physical part is the heat transfer process. We use a uh, finite difference. So for finite difference skin, you just need to concern about the surface boundary condition, which is combined by the uh, convection or radiation. So for the internal part of your material is doing the conduction heat transfer, right? So for the back, 
you you having a back boundary condition so it's uh either insulation without heat transfer or you having this uh, heat loss due to convection on radiation all right this is simple so the problem is this uh, pyrosis model is if you're looking at uh, the chemical process, it has uh, for those three components, it have at least nine parameters, right? Because for each component, you have three parameters, the pre expand potential factor, the activation energy, and the reaction order, all right? So for this red part, AW, EW, and NW, is the uh, kinetic property for water, because wood uh, would, wouldn't be always dry, right? It has always have some water inside of wood. So in terms of predicting the, the water pyrosis, the water decomposition, you need uh, an Arrhenius equation for it. So you've got another three parameters. So for the physical part, you have at least six parameters, right? For the uh, uh, raw wood, you have the uh, thermal conductivity, you have the density, as well as the specific heat. So, but for char, you have uh, the similar stuff. So you have um, easily, you got like uh, six plus nine is 15, and six plus 12 is 18. You got either 15 to 18 parameters you need to determine. So the difficulty come up, uh, the first thing is how to measure this property. It's really hard. How to combine them in the numerical model is no easy as well. And there might be some other materials behavior like charring. When the wood start to char, it's going to shrink, right? So if you're dealing with polymer, it's going to melt. So this very simple pyrosis model doesn't really take into account those effects, right? So this all making the difficulty. So if you're using the parameter, you're probably using some sort of like uh, experimental tool, uh, uh, experimental technique to measure them. But if you're putting those, measure the property into your numerical model, you end up like this, uh, like, like this picture. So you, as, as you can see, the FDS cannot really predict the experiment result, right? So. Some of the researchers like Simo and uh, Gilmo, they actually using, uh, they, they kind of propose using a genetic algorithm as a method to optimize those property to come up with a, a, a set of property which can use, I mean, specifically for the model. Uh, so with this optimized property, you can basically predict, very well predict your experimental result, but the difficulty for genetic algorithm method is, it's usually time consuming and it's very difficult to learn as a general fire engineer, you need to spend probably one or two years to study the genetic algorithm. This is really kind of like uh, uh, impossible to many people, all right? So it's possible to conceal some of the real physics in the problem. So we, we having this question, because there's a very common saying in English, like, give me six variable, I can fit through an elephant. So the question is, can GA result fit everything? And can this property fit all conditions? So what's the solution? I think one of the solution is we still need to split the chemical process and the physical process in the pyrolysis model. So the first thing we're doing this is we try to simplify the problem. We try to come up with a hand calculation method for the kinetic property. This is the method I actually come up with. But the people will criticize this method because you, when you're using GA, you're having a perfect answer to your results, right? But if you're using hand calculation method, you're having this answer is not, probably not as perfect as the GA result. But do we really need a perfect answer for the kinetic? property, that's my question. If you're looking at some of the problem, I, I would probably spend an hour to explain these slides. But if you, <laughs> but I, I don't have that kind of, that much time. So I have to try try as uh, as much as I can, right? So if you're looking at the, those DTG curve, you're having a distance between the peak temperature. Looking at this equation, this equation tells us the peak temperature of the DTG curve, basically determining the activation energy. But you also having a initial temperature for the thermal decomposition. And that 
temperature determine the activation energy as well. Let's give an example, which is lignin. Lignin is the most horrible material probably in the world for a high news equation because it has a very low decomposition temperature, but it has a very narrow peak distance in between the DT3 curve and the different heating rate. So the low decomposition temperature means it has a very low activation energy, but that narrow distance between the peak temperature in DTG curve indicating it, it should have a very high activation energy. So the simple conclusion is using a high news equation, you can never ever predict the thermal decomposition of lignin. All right. So we kind of like we fail in science of dealing with lignin already. So instead of looking for a perfect answer for the thermal decomposition, maybe we should think about, we don't have to use a perfect kinetic model. Maybe our model, we, we, we just, so we're doing some sensitivity analysis for the uh, kinetic property, uh, including uh, the activation energy and uh, the uh, reaction order. If you're looking at the picture and the top, you can see, so basically the modeling result is no sensitive, it's sensitive to the uh, activation energy, but it's, it's just totally no sensitive to the reaction order. So that's our answer. So, which is the reaction order, which indicating the detailed reaction pass has almost no effect to the modeling result. And the peak temperature is more important. So a hand calculation method is good enough for combustion modeling, which means and as long as we have already got a good prediction to the activation energy, we don't have to worry about the detail reaction pairs. So if you're looking at those pictures, for the hand cal, we're having the DTG arrow which is as high as like 15%, which is very bad prediction to the um, to the TG result, all right? But this kind of, this arrow denotes propagate to the large scale modeling of combustion, all right? So we can focus, I mean, we can get rid of the chemical part and focus on the physical part of our problem. So we have the confidence of doing the flame spread modeling later on, all right? So in terms of doing flame spread modeling, the first thing we do is doing small scale flame spread. So we, we kind of like extend the scale afterwards, right? So the first thing we do is we use this birch road. We perform a set of uh, flame spread um, experiment. The thing of doing this set of experiment is to get rid of the ignition effect. So for a single, for a, a, for a very simple flame spread problem, we know there are at least two reactions, two combustion reactions. The one is the ignition. So you, you always need something to ignite it, right? So that's the, the first combustion reaction. And the second one is the flame spread combustion reaction for the material itself. So the ignition will affect your result, which is why you need to perform this kind of experiment. If you're looking at the GIF I am showing here, you can see after ignition, the birch row will form a very steady state combustion uh, flame spread process. So this flame spread process will forget your ignition condition. That's what we got from the, either the modeling or the experiment. I mean, regardless of whatever stuff you're using to ignite it, it will end up with this steady state flame spread process, all right? So we build up um, some more physical, uh, we build up a numerical model uh, with this kinetic and some more physical properties. We, 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 we don't go detail into this, all right? So we try, we try very coarse mesh first, like 20 million meter per, uh, grid size. This is kind of like uh, you can hardly to image in real fire engineering case already, right? But even with so, so small grid size, 
we can now get a uh, just just reproduce the steady state frame spread. So we reduce the grid size to 10 millimeter. We still can now having a pretty, I mean, the flame cannot spread at all. But when we reduce the uh, grid size to five millimeter, we can start having some flame spread. When we reduce the grid size to two millimeter, we're having a relatively longer flame spread until we reduce our grid size to one millimeter, we can have a very steady state flame spread. So the first thing we to do is compare our one millimeter result to all the experiments. And we found that the one millimeter result can kind of like, uh, it's match, it's kind of having a reasonable agreement with the experiment. So we kind of, we think the one millimeter is good enough to predict the flame spread. So we extracting the spread ray. So if you're looking at this, uh, we can see, we don't have to worry about the transition stage. We just keep our focus on the steady state. So we, uh, we can extract, we can extract the heat flux field and the material surface. So this is the heat flux field. So by seeing this heat flux field, we know that this the current problem is a, a convection control problem. If you look at the convective heat flux is kind of like 20 to 40 kilowatt uh, per square meter, but for the radiation part, it's only like uh, four to five. Some is one magnitude lower. So this problem is a convection control problem. Uh, so we start looking at why and the coarse mesh, we can note having a good flame spread. So we, uh, I mean, similarly, we extract uh, the heat flux field from coarse mesh, all right? So by looking at the figure on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the solid line is the one millimeter case, all right? So for five millimeter case, if you remember, we're having some flame spread. And the, and, uh, the uh, sample surface and the material surface, you're having some heat flux, but it's not strong enough to sustain the flame spread, right? But when you increase the grid size to 10 millimeter and 20 millimeter, well, you have, you, you got no flame spread. You can see there's no totally, there's just no heat flux and the material surface. This is caused by the coarse mesh, which is why I am saying in the very beginning of my presentation that you need a very fine, uh, you need a very fine grid uh, to kind of like reproduce your boundary layer to kind of to, to having a good prediction to the heat flux field. Otherwise, you wouldn't have hot enough to ignite your material. So, which is why you you cannot having a steady flame spread in this case. So in terms of uh, resolving this problem, we have to dealing with the uh, source, source code of FDS. So we can kind of like fixing the heat flux field manually in this case, all right? So we, we fix the heat flux field under 10 millimeter and 20 millimeter to exactly, exactly the same as one millimeter. So uh, once we fix the heat flux field, we can have a steady state flame spread. So under course, uh, mesh. That's what we call virtual heat flux field method. All right. So uh, that's one uh, research I have ever done. And the second one is we kind of uh, try to reproduce the SBI experiment done in Belgium. So for the SBI corner experiment is uh, this kind of case. It, they use the propane burner with a heat of combustion of 46 to ignite an MDF ball with a heat of combustion of only eight. Uh, make Joe uh, per kilogram, all right? So this is the publication. So the, they, I mean, the, the Belgian group, they use fire form. Well, in this case, we try to use FDS to reproduce the SBI experiment. So the first thing we do is doing a uh, model uh, without MDF. So the purpose of doing so is to see if we having a good prediction to the heat flux field generate by the burner itself. And we compare, I mean, uh, FDS and the fire form, we found they are quite consistent and also consistent with the experimental result, which means uh, with our MDF, we're having a very good prediction to the heat flux generated by the burner. But when we put MDF into our model, we cannot 
get a good prediction of flame spread. As you can see, here is the prediction to the heat release rate. So this kind of like showing to me is uh, there are barely flame spread. You just you just burning the uh, you just burning the MDF material underneath your flame. Uh, that's what happened. And just remember, in this case, we use two reaction in the model. All right, two combustion reaction in the model. So the first thing we compare the supper models uh, between FDS and Fireform. We see if there's any problem inside of these things. And after the comparison, we see probably no. All those things are quite similar or either less sensitive to your result. So we 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 kind of confused. Why? I mean, why? So we start looking at those properties. The first thing we identify is basically the Belgian group that denotes use uh, uh, activation energy come up with, uh, I mean, come from the uh, TG result. They use, uh, I mean, from the TG result, you're getting an activation, you're getting an activation energy close to 200, while the the Belgian group, they use an activation energy only uh, 72. This is really weird. I mean, a, a lower activation energy definitely make your material easy to decompose, right? And easy to having flame spread, right? So we try this 72 and we figure that it, it, has, it has some effect, all right? Basically, you're having some flame spread, but not that much. So then we understand that they only use one combustion reaction in their model with only one uh, heat of combustion, which is the heat of combustion of propane. So we look at uh, just kind of uh, what's the effect it's going to cause? That's the question. So in both FDS and uh, fire form, if you're having a material which has a different heat of combustion than your main combustion reaction, what Fireform and FDS do is using the equation as I show here to maintain the heat release rate are exactly the same. So basically for MDF, if you having use the heat of combustion of propane, so to maintain the heat release rate, you need to reduce the mass loss rate out of your MDF board. All right. So this is the equation. So, you know, uh, H MDF is A and H propane is 46. So to maintain the heat release rate, you need to that the, the mass generate by this board will be significantly reduced. So what's What's the effect out of this kind of like one combustion reaction model is you're basically having a much smaller flame. So think about it. What's the, what's the effect out of this much smaller flame? You're having exactly the, the same heat release rate, but your flame is much smaller. So basically your flame temperature is significantly increased. All right. So Increasing the flame temperature will definitely increase the flame heat flux that the, the, the radiation, all right? So it will eventually lead to the flame spread. So that's the trick basically in their model. I mean, we spent kind of like half a year to identify what's happened there. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's just uh, just just kind of like a, a pretty pretty tough work. I would say so. We do a, a lot of sensitivity analysis for the uh, both the uh, activation energy and the kinetic property as well as the heat of combustion. So, if you look at the figure and the right hand side, you can see if you reduce the heat of combustion of your uh, combustion reaction in the model, you don't have to reduce it to the MDF like like a megajoule per kilogram. You just reduce it to thirty six. You won't be able to get any, get any flame spread. You just the flame spread just stop. All right. So we use exactly the same model to reproduce their result. So this is the, the the thing we eventually get. We kind of getting pretty much exactly the same prediction to the flame spread as fire four. 
And uh, we use exactly the same model. So for the corner fire problem, uh, it's good, all right? But for the large scale, if the same model can be used for large scale flame spread would be my, our question, all right? So uh, this is the experiment we done in New Zealand. This uh, large scale, it, it, it wouldn't be as large as your image because the lens is only two meter and the height is so one meter. The, the, width is only one meter as well. So, but it's kind of like uh, much bigger than the SBI experiment already. So this is the, the compartment. So we burn the compartment, this MDF, and we eventually get the flash over in the compartment. So we doing the same thing. We use exactly the same numerical model from the S SBI experiment. So we re reproduce, we, we build on uh, uh, MDF compartment in FDS. So th uh, this is uh, the uh, physical model of that compartment. So it, we, I mean, in this case, we also use a propane burner. That's what we used in the ex experiment as well. So it's good. We don't use any other gas to ignite the compartment. All right. So this is uh, what happened in the, um, in the model. Uh, one of the good thing I would like to say, regardless of uh, what's the what's the problem with those publications and and uh, our publication as well. I mean, it's uh, I would I would I would say it's a very good trial to doing this flame spread modeling. I mean, if you never try, you never get it right. So the first thing is at least we can make the flame spread inside of the compartment. We try this kind of model before, but we never get a flame spread. I mean, the flame never spread, or it might spread really fast. But by using this model, we get a kind of like a reasonable flame spread process. So this is the heat release rate we predict. So as you can see, the red line is the FDS. If you're looking at these uh, figures, you can easily conclude what we got in FDS is a very easy to spread model. So I mean, the, in FDS, the material is much easier to spread than reality. So that's what actually show in this figure, as you can see for experiment three, right? In 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 the experiment, it it, it almost extinguished and then spread again. But in FDS, it spread really fast. So for the peak heat release rate, it has very good comparison. It has like less than seven percent. Uh, the FDS predicting the uh, peak heat release rate of the experiment. The error is less than 77%. But for the heat flux and the temperature, it's definitely lower. For the temperature, it's lower than approximately like, I mean, 14%. Uh, if you're looking at this steady state, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, figures and the right hand side is the temperature, while the figure and the left left hand side is the uh, is the heat flux. Sorry, I put a wrong uh, legend for them, a uh, wrong title for them. And uh, what happened is uh, the temperature prediction is lower than like kind of like fourteen percent, but the uh, heat flux is much lower than the experiment. It's probably lower than uh, forty five to fifty percent. That's that's um, that's significantly lower, right? But you still get a flame spread. And this is another evidence that uh, kind of like indicating uh, that our model uh, is easier to flame spread than real material. Because the flame can spread in a relatively lower heat flux and relatively lower temperature, all right? So that's the thing. So. Uh, just uh, the SBI experiment is not enough to justify the feasibility of your numerical model. That's one thing I would like to say. I mean, you have to use a different scale experiment. In this case, we use the small scale and we also use a large scale experiment to kind of validate our numerical model. All right. So you just need to use different set of experiment. But I mean, the real world is, uh, I mean, these days, uh, a lot of these models, they just use one experiment. Like 
the, the I have ever seen some of the paper, they just model the pool fire. They just use one diameter of pool to model and then they claim that our numerical model is the, the best model in the world. This is really <laughs> not that justified it, all right? So the current model is easy to flame spread with the modified heat of combustion and activation energy. So we just got to understand the effect by increasing the heat of combustion of MDF from A to 46 of propane, we are actually changing the heat flux and the phase interface, all right? So we don't have to, I mean, the good thing, good part of this is we don't have to uh, modify the source code. We just need to increase the heat of combustion. So we're having a higher heat, heat flux and the intersurface, we can heat the material up and make the flame spread. Another thing is we reduce the activation energy, which makes the material much easier to uh, to uh, to decompose, and then you you easily you have flame spread. So I mean a lot of people are quite used to reduce the activation energy, but you got just got to be aware if you don't have a very good heat flux prediction and the surface. If you reduce the activation energy, you probably end up having a material which can decompose and, and under ambient temperature. So you're having an extremely faster flame spread. That's what happened. I mean, I see a lot of cases when they're doing flame spread, they try to modify the properties of the material. And then they end up having either extremely faster flame spread or totally no flame spread at all. They never have a, 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 a medium flame spread process. That's one thing. I think that's the, the one benefit that the model will give to us. All right. So the, 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 the last one is the peak HR. I mean, the HR after threshold was still useful to risk assessment. All right. So I, I quickly showing this. This is one real case. We're doing the fire investigation for a real case. That in this case, there are two fatality. But um, uh, so. Uh, most of those, uh, the, the compartment is made by wood, which is I think we can use our model to actually reproduce the flame spread process. The, the thing is, um, they're having a wrong in, um, they're having kind of a, a wrong uh, judgment of the fire source. This is the original judgment, but this is the real uh, the, the fire location. All right, so we just use this, uh, our model to reproduce the case. And we, eventually we found that the ventilation is the main effect affecting the uh, judgment of the fire brigade. So uh, as the, the, the ventilation is affecting the combustion process, the fire close to the window is burning more uh, intensely. So it kind of like having uh, more material being burned out in this area. So they determine the uh, fire location in the very beginning, but uh, the video told us, in fact, is ignite in uh, the left hand, the left part of the compartment. So uh, this is the the thing we use our model uh, to actually uh, having some sort of like a real practice uh, to help the local fire brigade. Uh, all right, so uh, this is. Uh, mainly my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. It may be a little bit faster, but uh, the question is welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the impressive and attractive lecture. Here is Tianhang Zhang speaking, and for, for the following several minutes, I will host the Q&A season. For the audiences, yes. please feel thank free you. to give your questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, okay, so so far we received a question from Dr. Cai Yixiong. Uh, he said, Hi, sir. Could you explain more about how to get the virtual heat flux? I'm quite not clear about this part. Thanks. Uh, you mean uh, virtual okay. heat flux? It's not like uh, we, we don't get it. We don't. Uh, if you're looking at this figure, all right, this is the original heat flux, all right? So if you want to fix this heat flux to this, you just need to kind of like go into the source code of FDS, 
to fix the heat flux and every grid. All right, so in, in the source code, you're having a heat flux and the, the, the grid, all right? So you just need to uh, put these uh, numbers into the grid of course mesh. So you kind of like, like fixing the heat flux and the course mesh to, to this case. This is the, the heat flux field after you fix it. So if you're having this kind of like heat flux field, you're having a steady state flame spread. That's my answer. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Professor. And uh, very soon, another question. Uh, mm -hmm. When I do fire simulation, I also found that the simulated heat flux was, was much smaller than the measured ones. Can you talk about mm -hmm. more about what caused this phenomenon and how do you change the heat risk rate to change the internal heat flux? Uh, this is a, this is a good question. And basically, what caused the heat flux being under predicts is because when you having a coarse mesh, all right, you having uh, you having uh, it's 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 not easy to describe. In the you having the gas will react with your oxygen in your mesh, all right. So the heat it generate out of this kind of reaction gas will be distributed to the whole volume of your mesh. You understand what I mean? So if you're having a big mesh, you distribute more. But remember, your flame shoot is, is millimeter or less than millimeter, all right? So if you distribute to a grid less than one millimeter, you're having a, a high temperature, of course, all right? If you distribute, kind of like putting your heat into a big volume, which is your grid, obviously your temperature will significantly decrease. So if your temperature decrease, remember you're using Stephen, Stephen Boltzmann model to model the radiation, which is the temperature uh, to the uh, power of four, all right? So if your temperature decrease like one, uh, 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 like 20 degrees C, you can do the calculation. You can just, 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 uh, you can just do it. You can see how much it will decrease for the radiative heat flux. So that's the thing. All right. So if you, I mean, uh, similarly, if you increase, if you, decrease, I mean, the flame warren, you're having the, 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 the obviously you, you are distributing the same heat to, to this small volume of flame, all right? So your temperature is increasing. So increasing your flame temperature will significantly increase your heat flux similarly. Cause temperature is, Kind of like to the power of four. That's the radiation calculation. All right. So yeah, that, so, yeah that's my yeah, answer. That, that, that makes sense. Okay. okay. So we have another question uh, from Dr. Xi Chang. Thanks, Professor Li, for the sharing. It's really convenient way to model fire sprite. I just wonder, can we also use larger grid for the modeling of, of the sprite of fire burning on a wooden strips? What is the size do you recommend? Uh, um, it's hard to say. It's hard to say because if you use FDS, you know there's a, a, a parameter which is called D star for poor fire. All right. So basically, if you are dealing with flame spread problem, you need to resolve the boundary layer in between solid and gas phase. But if you're dealing with wood creep, you probably wouldn't need that kind of detail resolution for the interface. So it's kind of like a similar, like the poor fire. I mean, uh, I haven't any make any exercise, but for me, is you don't have to, probably you don't have to worry about the uh, very small grid size uh, dealing with wood creep. But you can try. In the end, we we always figure out what's the real 
kind of like uh, for um, every fire problem, you probably have a good, uh, I mean, a proper grid size uh, to dealing with them. But you just need to try. I mean, I don't have the answer, but you ask me if you're asking me poor fire, I can tell you, you can you can try uh, this star. I mean, uh, this star divided by 10 would be a very good solution already. But that's all from experience. Yes, Thank you. yes. Yeah, that's why we need to do a grid sensitivity study or grid independent study. Yeah, exactly, we... exactly. Definitely, yes. definitely. Yeah, you, you got to make sure your grid independent. Your, your physical problem is independent to your grid size. You got to make sure that. OK, thank you, Professor. And uh, we have last two questions due to the time limit. Uh, the first one, oh, it's also about the, the grid size. Uh, OK. I will just ask her, what is the grid size of the safety model for the Hunan fire case study? Ah, that's very big, to be honest. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that, if you look at those, uh, it's, 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 it's very big, to be honest. Um, but even under such a big uh, model, uh, even under such a big model, uh, if you look at this, this the, the model, it has like a 12 meter almost uh, 17 meter in length and uh, 3.5 meter in the waist. And the, the highest is like four or five meter, uh, five meter, right? Five meter, here we go. Uh, I, I cannot, uh, uh, so we use the grid size in this case is, uh, I think is five centimeter in the end. Cause we try to do two, but we use supercomputer. We use like 128 cores for, in the supercomputer, but even so, it's really, really slow. So we cannot uh, achieve our result probably within one month or something like that. So we, we decide to increase the grid size to five centimeter. But even so, the good thing is we still having flame spread in this case. This is kind of like surprising. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the last question uh, from Ijo. Thanks for sharing, Professor. Is uh, if the grid size of simulation results are much finer than other works, but cannot be validated by experiments, how could we judge the value of the numerical work? Uh, sorry again. Uh, if okay, what? I think uh, he is basically asking uh, if yeah. uh, if a uh, if a simulation result cannot be validated by experiment, then how could we judge the values of the numerical work? Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> um, I think I would I would use uh, I would use the, the 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 kind of like the statement from Gilmo, which is uh, if you do not understand the magnitude of your answer, you don't use the numerical software. So basically, I would say is you you just need to I think we 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 saw a lot of abuse for numerical model. So it, it's really hard to kind of like um, uh, judge like uh, if they are doing the right thing or wrong thing. But I mean, you just have to live with it. All right. So. What I would like to say is we probably need uh, enough education. We probably need uh, experience in fire engineering. We need um, knowledge in fire dynamics. We need the kind of like the basic understanding of CFD before we really using CFD for fire engineering design. Because if you do not have those fundamental knowledge, you probably will end up abusing the CFD result. And then if all of us having the same fundamental knowledge, we probably just stay on the same page of doing such things. So people can judge whether you are giving a reasonable
prediction or you are just giving a totally nonsense answer? That's the thing. Yeah, I can't agree more. Yeah. yeah, I can't agree more. I totally agree with you. For, for many times, I think uh, the result is uh, explainable and reasonable. It's more important than the accuracy. Yes, I okay. think so. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so since we already spent out our time, uh, I have to say it's the end of this webinar. Thanks again for Professor Lee gave this impressive webinar, and thanks for all our audience for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you for your time.